This is the new Patreon uh, presentation number 66 in my series called Unraveling Yeshua's Heart Sayings. This is saying if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. And obviously this is not really a recommended thing to do. Now, what is the context of this saying? It's linked in all cases to the saying about cutting off the right hand. If your right eye causes you to fall into sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your right hand causes you to fall into sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into Gehenna. And uh, Mark and Matthew and Papias. Um, this is the statement as it appears in um, uh, Matthew. It's, it's better for you to lose these parts than for your whole body to go to hell. Now, right eye. Uh, we have to look at what the statement's about the eye and the right eye. Um, there is an idea, idea in the ancient times of the evil eye. It's the Hebrew ayin uh, hara, uh, the eye of, e of the evil, which is an Aramaic uh, statement we know from other sources. You can find more about this in the Jewish virtual library. And to fall into sin is the Hebrew Aramaic kashal, to stumble and grow weak and fall. So the whole body, the Aramaic niblach, the Hebrew basar flesh, but meaning flesh after death, referring to the after death body or nefesh that experiences purgatorial uh, cleansing or purification in Gehenna in the third heaven for a period of time after death, not for any eternity. The right hand is allegorical for one's powers of action. So if your right hand causes you to fall into sin, if your actions uh, or your powers of actions call you to fall into sin, uh, to stumble or to grow weak and, and, and fail or fall. Now this is hyperbole. Um, Jesus used hyperbole, uh, extreme language, uh, not to be taken literally in order to make a point and this is an example of that. It was Yeshua's characteristic use of paradox and hyperbole that made many of his davarim easy to remember and transmit in the oral Jesus tradition, but difficult to translate and interpret correctly in transmission as isolated Greek logia without context. Example, whoever does not hate his own father and mother cannot be my disciple. It means that if you want to be my disciple, your spiritual love for God and divine Malkuth must greatly exceed your human love for parents and family. So this is a hyperbolic statement. Uh, and uh, we have to also understand what is meant by Gehenna. It does not mean hell. Now, where does this occur? We find in Mark 9th chapter and Matthew the 5th chapter, the uh, Sermon on the Plain of the Sermon on the Mount and Papias. And Mark adds to the saying, where their worm, Gehenna, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, quoting Isaiah in a later edition. The Markan eschatological addition to the saying is probably a post second century gloss because it does not appear in Matthew or Papias. It quotes Isaiah 66 24 the day of Yahweh's judgment. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. This is totally unrelated to Yeshua saying uh, about purgatory or purification, Gehenna, after death. The worm was a reference to human flesh being eaten by worms that decomposed dead bodies on the battlefield after the victors departed, leaving no one to bury them. That, that means some references you might be interested in are here in Job and Psalms and Isaiah. 
Now there is a possible prophetic reference in these uh, words of Yeshua that we need to look at because they eliminate some of the aspects of it. Uh, this is, uh, there's a possibility that uh, prophetic saying was part of Yeshua's woes to the Judean Pharisees. If so, it could have referred to the prophet second Zechariah, that is the second part of Zechariah, and the woes that he uh, declaimed to the worthless shepherds of Israel in 1117. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the field, a sword will be in his right arm, in his uh, right eye, his arm will be totally withered, his right eye will be blind. So it's, here's the uh, the hand and the and the right eye. A better translation of this verse, by the way, is Woe, may the sword strike his arm and his right eye. May his arm be completely withered and his right eye totally blinded. So here Zechariah proclaims woes to Israel's spiritual leaders, referring back to the antithesis of Ezekiel's prophecy of the Messianic age in, in Ezekiel 37. And my servant David shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd, i.e. God, whom the Christians later identified as Jesus, the good shepherd. And second Zechariah, which begins in chapter 19, was a collection of favorite messianic proof texts for gospel writers and a source for detail in the passion narrative. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, this saying we're looking at of Yeshua was not authentic and that it was just uh, brought up and put in by the, uh, the writers of the gospels because this does not uh, at all uh, advance any of their spin or anything. So you will recognize themes, however, from the earliest version of the Passion narrative in 2 Zechariah. If you look at it, for example, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and, meaning an even, uh, uh, upon the colt of the foal of an ass, which doesn't mean he's riding on two animals as it appears in the Gospels because they didn't understand the the Hebrew uh, way of using uh, a second clause to amplify the first clause. It means, uh, it, it specifies he's riding upon an ass, a donkey, and even upon a young ass, a very small donkey. And then here's another one. And I said to them, if ye think good, give me my price, if not forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And that may be where the 30 pieces of silver got put into the Gospels. It's the price of a slave that is gored to death by an ox that we find in Exodus. And this is connected to the bargain of Judas in Matthew 26 which the high priest or writers of Matthew knowingly or unknowingly fixed on the price of 30 pieces of silver. Uh, Bereshit Rabbah notices that this prophecy belongs, quote, to the Messiah. And when Yeshua entered Jerusalem through the Messiah gate, riding on a donkey as a prophetic act, in Hebrew the ass and the coal were one animal, he probably intended it as a declaration that the Messianic age was about to begin, but later Christians interpreted it as a sign that Jesus was Christ or Messiah. But Yeshua's saying about eye and hand are probably not part of the woes because they fit all the criteria for authentic Davrim, especially hyperbole. So I conclude that this is an authentic Davar. Um, if your right eye causes you to fall into sin, tear it out and throw it away, it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into Gehenna. And Gehenna does not mean hell and damnation, it simply means a period of, uh, of purification through after death uh, uh, introspection that is not uh, pleasant, <laughs> but it not doesn't last eternally. It lasts anywhere from a few hours to a couple of days. 
at the most, for the most evil of people, according to the rabbis of that period, it can last for a year. And if your whole, if, you, if your right hand, which means your actions that you choose to make, causes you to fall into sin, which means to uh, to kick up all all the consequences of sin, cut it off and throw it away. That is, stop doing that stuff. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into Gehenna again, this place of uh, temporary uh, torment, but purification. So the meaning is to root out and sublimate and purify your moral weaknesses now in this life so that your astral or sidereal body, the nephesh, need not suffer purification in the purgatorial processes after death. That's what it would mean. This is, uh, the nephesh is in contrast to the immortal neshama or soul, which is the birth breath of a newly born infant that Yahweh breathed into Adam at his formation or construction by the Elohim in the second chapter of Genesis. God, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. So please click on the Patreon link in my description just below the video to become a patron, helping to sponsor my new videos on the pre-Christian teachings of Yeshua. And for a patronage of $2 or more per lecture, which would be $4 a month, you will receive PDF files of books featured in this series and passwords to wisdom seminars courses that are commensurate with your level of support. Thank you very much.